CSIS 2430 is filmed before a live studio audience. The new subject of the day, rules of inference, okay? What rules of inference are? They're kind of like what we learned about logical equivalences the other day, like on day one, I guess, logical equivalences, okay? These are other rules that, that we're going to look at proofs that these are logically the same thing, all right? So we're going to deal with three concepts in this, in this section here. Arguments, what are the rules of inference? And there's just a set of rules that we're going to not quite memorize, but we have to kind of be really familiar with. And then how to build an argument. Remember, we're talking about proofs here, right? What do you do with a proof? You're making an argument. We're going to learn how to take an English sentence or two or three that we can turn into a mathematical argument and prove that our English sentence is correct. Let's start off with this first statement here. All lions are fierce. Whether or not this is true is irrelevant. This is what I'm claiming is true. Just like a proposition, right? I'm claiming it's true. I'm also claiming that some lions do not drink coffee. Therefore, I can conclude, this is the conclusion, that some fierce creatures do not drink coffee. Now, regardless of the formula or the math or the equation, does that look reasonable to you? That if, if, if it's true that all lions are fierce, and if it's true that some lions don't drink coffee, then it obviously is true that some fierce creatures don't drink coffee. Okay? Well, something simple like this, and we're going to actually look at a real, real proof of it later today, maybe on Wednesday, mathematically. But something this simple, um, it's, we look at it and we go, well, obviously this is true. But sometimes it's way more complicated. When we get to the hummingbird proof, we'll see this, that it's a little bit more involved, and we're going to learn how to make this where we're 100% sure that this is true. So let's take a look at how this would play out if we were to formalize this. Let's start off with this as um, P of X is a lion. So uh, X is a lion. And we're going to say Q of X means X is fierce. And then R of X, we're going to use R for drink. The R there. X drinks coffee. The domain is all creatures. All right. With that in mind, what would these formulas look like to state this first thing here? What would this formula for this look like? Oh, and I've got them all. I've revealed them all. Darn it. I was hoping to do them one at a time. That's, that's me not doing my slides right. Sorry about that. But yeah. So the idea is for all X, which is all creatures. So for every creature, if it's a lion, therefore it is fierce. Now, what um, I heard a second ago, this is a common mistake, and I'm glad that somebody said this. Let's talk about this one for a minute, why this is not true. Yes, exactly right. Okay, it's talking about honey badgers, right? This says, for all creatures, not only that, it says that creature is a lion and it's fierce. So there's no other creature but lions is what that statement's claiming. That, and they're fierce, yeah. So you are a fierce lion. I am a fierce lion. You are a fierce lion. That's what that's saying, right? So we're saying, no, if you're a lion, then therefore you're fierce. Okay. Some lions don't drink coffee. So that just simply, here's one way to write it. There exists some lion, some, some creature X, that, such that it is a lion and it doesn't drink coffee. Dig it? It's not, it's a lion, therefore it doesn't drink coffee. Because our claim was that some lions don't, which means that maybe some do. Now, obviously, we probably know the answer to that, right? But this is a simple, silly one to get the idea, right? Last one, there are, some fierce creatures do not drink coffee. There exists some creature that is fierce, and it does not drink coffee. Do we buy into those formulas? I've cleaned up all the little notes in the mess here, and look at the screen here. All lions are fierce. That's the one formula. Some lions do not drink coffee. Some fierce creatures do not drink coffee. So... These two, and it was on the previous slide, I forgot to mention it while we were there. This and this are, these are the premises. This is the conclusion. The way this idea works, the way a proof works, oftentimes, there, there's exceptions, but oftentimes this is the way it works. You start out with some premise, and you have some other premise, and you're, you claim that, well, if premise A is true and premise B is true, therefore conclusion XYZ is true, but we want to prove it mathematically. So if I want to prove this mathematically, what am I really saying here? I'm saying this and this implies that, right? Simplifying, let's just for the moment call this P, this Q, this R. 
I'm basically saying P and Q implies R. Now, it just so happens that P is a lot more than just a simple P. It's a whole bunch of crap, right? And so is Q and so is R. But that is essentially what's going on. That's what a proof's all about. If these premises are true, therefore this conclusion is true. Okay, that's what a proof is. We just have to do it mathematically to make sure we know what we're talking about. Okay, so let's start with our formulas again. And I've just changed the colors here to make reading this the same, but these are the same formulas, right? This was the one about lions being fierce. This is the one about lions not drinking coffee. And this is the conclusion that some fierce creatures don't drink coffee. This is the formal way you would write this. You write the two or three or ten or however many premises. Then you draw a line. And then you put these three little dots here, which stand for therefore. And then you write your conclusion. Okay? What I'm saying here, and I wrote this out on the previous screen, that this and this together implies this. Now, whether the math proves out or whether it's true that some fierce creatures don't drink coffee and on and on, regardless of all of that, do you agree and understand the premise of how this functions and how it works? Do we get that? Does that make sense? If you don't know or you don't get it, please let me know. I want to make sure we're clear on this. This is sort of the foundation of getting into a proof. We good? Okay. So let's go back to the simple stuff from day one to look at this in simple terms. Let P be the statement that I won the lottery. Let Q be the statement I will give you a dollar. I'm saying P, therefore Q. If I won, if I won the lottery, therefore I will give you a dollar. Okay, we remember that from day one. All right. Well, let's just say if we know, forget how we know, but if we know that that's true, and if we know that P is true, and P is this statement right here, then what can we conclude for sure is true? Which is alpha, algebraically or mathematically, Q. If, if I have a scenario of a P, therefore Q, and I know the hypothesis is true, and I know that the whole statement is true, then therefore I can conclude whatever Q is. Does it matter what Q is? It does not. Mathematically, I can conclude that Q is also true, which can be very useful in a proof. Okay? So I can, as you guys pointed out, I can conclude Q. Dig it? Okay. This is how you would write that. You would write, and the only thing that goes here are things that you know to be true. What you're ultimately trying to figure out is if those are true, which I'm claiming they are, is this also true, right? And this is one that we know that that's true. So premise, premise, conclusion. Look at this below here. This is a tautology, which we talked about that a while ago. I like how it sort of makes an upside down speech bubble for me. Like it just knows I want that somehow. I don't know. Weird. But this tautology, let, let's look at what's going on. Let me erase some of my ink here. This is claiming that this, this, and this, therefore this. That's all that this says right here. Right? Well, this and this imply this will always be true. If you plug this into a truth table, which we are about to do, it will always be true regardless of what P and Q's values are. P and Q's values have no bearing. This will always be true. If it's always true, no matter what P and Q's values are, that is what's called a tautology, right? We talked about it on day one. So let's look at a truth table here. We know P and Q's values, right? We just plug in every combination of P and Q. We all agree with that. Okay, we know the, the P, therefore Q values, right? Do we agree with those statements? Make sure you look at them and make sure I didn't typo. I'm pretty sure I didn't, but just make sure we are good. Okay. So now I want to figure out this and this, right? That's going to go here. Do you agree with those statements? This and this. Well, the first one is true, true. And then the rest of these, there's a false in there Some, Whoops, sorry. There's a false in there somewhere. There's a false right there. There's a false there and a false there, which makes those false. Agreed? Okay. So now 
knowing what we know about conditionals, this, therefore that, and this squared thing is just this right here, okay? So I'm looking at this, therefore that, right there, right? Well, what is the truth value of that? Well, true, therefore true, what's the truth value of that? True. And all the other ones, what's the starting point? When the starting point is false, it always evaluates to true. We don't care. And I'm glad you said exactly that phrase. We don't care. Because when it comes to a proof, if the starting point is not true, I don't care. If I did not win the lottery, it doesn't matter if I give you a dollar or not. You might want me to give you one, but it doesn't matter because I'm only going to prove to you that I will give it to you if I win. Okay? And so you'll see that evaluates to true no matter what combination of P's and Q's you have or if we have P's, Q's, R's, and whatever's, no matter what combination, this final equation here is always true. That's called the tautology. And every one of these, this is one of the rules of inference. It's actually called modus ponens. And every single rule of inference will have a tautology that goes along for the ride. And we'll look at each one of those in a moment. Okay? And there, well, I, let's see, this is before I had a marker and I can write on the screen. So I was doing it in my PowerPoint there. So there, look, mark. See how perfect my square is that I just drew right now? All right. So again, this tautology, it's called modus ponens. The, the full name is modus ponendo ponens. It's Latin for mode that affirms by affirming. We often just call it modus ponens or MPP, right? Which is modus ponendo ponens. Okay? So in a proof, you would write some, when you make a step using modus ponens, you would put next to it by, hello, by modus ponens or whatever, something like that. That would be your step. We're going to walk through this exactly in a moment. How do we feel about this idea? That's our first rule of inference. We feel okay? Okay. So back to our original statement here. Look at this statement here. It's a little different than before. If that is true and that is true, what can I conclude? Nothing. Very good. Nothing. That doesn't tell me anything. I know this is true. Okay, that's interesting. That means if I win, I'll give you the dollar. We know that. But I gave you a dollar. What does that prove? That doesn't prove anything. I, I can give you a dollar without winning, right? So it does not prove anything. So what does this prove? Nothing. And here's why. This, look at this tautology here. It's not a tautology anymore. That, that statement that is a tautology, tautology, if that were a P, okay? But because we have a scenario where it could be false, then this is not, this doesn't, we cannot conclude anything. The only time we can use these rules of inference is if they exist because we know that the tautology that goes along for the ride is also true. That is a mouthful to say, do we understand it? This is the important point. This is right out of your book, rules of inference, right? So I think they're all pretty clear on the screens you guys are close enough to. This one's written on, but I think you're good. Okay. So we just talked about modus ponens right here. And we saw the tautology that goes with it, and here's its name. All right? Do we agree with that? Do we understand it? Does it make sense? We feel okay about it. Okay. There's another one called modus tollens, or modus tenendo tollens, and it's something that affirms by denying, I think is what it, well, I think it's on another slide. But met, mode or method that affirms by denying, I believe is what that stands for. I'm never going to ask you what it means like that. I just but that's the Latin translation. Do you have it on your print out there, Amanda? No. Okay. So, but look at what's happening here. I want to before we explain that, the, you know, convince ourselves that these statements are true. I just want to make sure you see how we're the, what's written on the screen here. So I'm claiming that if that's true, which is not Q, and if P therefore Q is true, that I can conclude that. That is the claim. Whether or not you believe that's another story. They are all true. I'm not, this is not a trick. They are all true. But whether or not you believe them is irrelevant for the moment. What I want to make sure you understand is that that is saying that on every one of those lines. Okay? So I'm claiming that and that, therefore that. Dig it? Same thing here. I'm claiming that and that, therefore that. That's what this says. That and that, therefore that. So on down the line. Yeah. 
That is correct. Yes, the question was, if they're stacked like this, where I have something here, something here, then a line, and then something, this is always an and. Because what's happening here, let me erase some of these marks. Good question. What's happening here is this. I'm claiming that this is true, and I'm also claiming that this is true. <laughs> this is a left-handed check mark. And I'm claiming that if that's true, which I say it is, and if that's true, there's your and, then this must also be true, okay? Now, by the way, these are all just some rules of inference that happen to be one or two premises. Like this is only one premise, right? Uh, this is only one premise. These are two premises. There are, you, you can have situations where you have three, four, five, six, a dozen premises, whatever, right? But these are just some common ones that you'll run into all the time when you're doing a proof, and it's a little chart to help you remember what these are. We'll, we'll probably talk about resolution another day. That's probably the trickiest one to look at. But look at each one of these. Let's see. Um, let's start with this guy. P, therefore, Q, and not Q. Notice I changed the order. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying they're both true, right? How can we conclude from that not P? So the contrapositive. Let's look at what's the contrapositive of this. It's not, what is that? Not Q, therefore not P. All right? So now what? How does that help us? We know that not Q is true. Where's not Q right here? Okay. If not Q is true, and this whole thing is true, well, this is a tricky step, so let's back up. If this is true, this is true. Agreed? Right? Because it's the contrapositive of it. Okay. Well, we also know this is true. So that means this is true. Well, we also, since we know this whole thing is true, and we know the first thing is true, well, it's a conditional. If the first thing is true, the last thing has to be true. So this has to be true. So we can conclude that. Okay? And you can logic your way through every one of these and prove to yourself that they are true. Plug them into truth tables if you want, but they are all true. They all pan out. Some of them are really easy to spot. Like take, um, oh, let's go, look at this one. P or Q is true. Not P is true. Therefore, Q has to be true. Right? In order for this to be true, one of those two statements has to be true. Well, I've already told you that P is not true. So that means Q has to be the true one in the relationship there. Okay? Let's look at this one. That's called the dis disjunctive syllogism. Okay? Let's look at this one. Addition. This one's a no-brainer, guys. If P is true, then P or Q is true. Right? I mean, that's, that's, that's silly, but it can come in useful in a proof. Okay? If that's true, then we also know that P is true. Agreed? What else do we know is true? Q is also true. We know that for sure. If we know that's true, and we know that's true, we know that's true. Because that's all that top line's saying anyway. It's just saying P and Q, right? It's the same thing. Look at the hypothetical syllogism, okay? Let's take a look at that one for a minute. This is basically sort of a cut out the middleman kind of a deal. All right, we're saying that if if P, therefore Q, we're saying that's true, and we're also saying Q, therefore R, then that means P, therefore R, is true. Can you see that? So let's walk through that. P, therefore Q, the whole thing is true, because that's just simply the claim of the premise. Q, therefore R, is also being claimed to be true. That's the claim of the premise. Okay, now, if this whole thing is true, how is it that P, therefore, R is also true? Let's take a look at the only possible values of P and Q. Let's go with a scenario where Q is false. Okay? Which would mean what about P? It has to be false. Yeah, it has to be false. Okay, so now we're claiming that Q is false. Well, now look at this. We know that P is false by default. We know that Q is false right here. 
Therefore, what does R have to be? It has to be false. Therefore, P, which is false, and R, which is false, that does evaluate to true. Plug in different scenarios. Okay, let's try a situation where Q is true. Well, if Q is true, what does P have to be? It has to be true, or it could be false, right? We already know what happens. Let's start with it being true, all right? That means this is true, which means this has to be true, which means P and Q are true, or P and R are true, which means that's true, right? Okay? The other scenario is that's true and that's false, which means this is false. You stop it. Oh my gosh, it's so annoying. Okay. If this is false, it doesn't matter what R is. We the, Our initial point here, P is false. That being false, who cares what that is? This will evaluate the true. So that, if you didn't follow everything I just did, that's okay. Plug in the numbers yourself, the trues and falses, and you will see that they do pan out. Right? And as long as you understand conditionals and by, or just conditionals, you should be okay. All right? Feel okay about that? Yeah. 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 So that that's a different situation. So what that she, what she's asking about is when we looked at the logical equivalences, like on day one or day two, where you have the whatever is logically equivalent to whatever, the triple equal sign, the hamburger. Um, that's simply saying that two things are they have the same truth value no matter what condition. This is not necessarily saying that. Now, this part here is a tautology, which is saying that this, therefore, this will always be true. But I'm not telling you anything that it's logically equivalent to. There are things out there that it's logically equivalent to, but I have not shared what those are, that we didn't talk about any of that. Does that make sense? So this is not logically equivalent to anything. This is just simply saying that whenever that's true and that's true, this will be true. So... Um, so are you asking if, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying, I, I know what you're asking. I'm trying to find space here to word it and write it. My racers decided not to play today. Okay, let's clear all that out. So, so in other words, what she's asking is P, P therefore Q, Q, and we know that if that's true, if that's true, this will be true. So are you asking if P and P, therefore Q, is that logically equivalent to Q? That's what you're asking? Okay. Show me where, where am I changing the arrows? Right. Right, uh, right here? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying P equals Q? Yeah. And then, oh, I see what you're asking me. Okay, and Q, Q equals R. No, I get what you're saying now. Sorry about that confusion there. No, so then are you saying that um, therefore P is logically equivalent to R? Is that, right, is that what you're saying? Is, yeah, will, will that be true? What rule did we look at earlier that you're the, the, well so if you're talking about the commutative rule that's all that's simply saying is that this and this is the same as this and that just rearranging the order <coughs> right in algebra right there's com associative commutative or commutative and Let's look at it afterwards when, when you find out which one it is. Oh, that's uh, the transitive. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that, that. Well, yeah. So the transitive law is, it's not even nailed down to anything specific. It's not nailed down to 
this is kind of like the transitive, so I, now I see what you're getting at. Sorry about that. Um, a little slow there. I apologize. Um, yeah, this is kind of like the transitive property where, um, again, yeah, if, if P is equal to Q and Q is equal to R, then stop sliding. Then P is equal to R or whatever, right? That is true. That is a completely different thing. That's, that's nothing to do with this. It just happens to be that that will be true. But they're not, there's no relationship there that you can't simply change the arrow to equal signs. I, I don't think that's what you're saying. Can I just change it? You're just saying if I did, would that law hold? And yeah, because what when you do that, the moment you've done that, what you did is just simply having nothing to do with this. You just simply stated the transitive law. That's all you did. You simply stated the transitive law. Right. That's all that that's that's what happened there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer your question more importantly? So here we go. We're going to play a little game here. Which rule of inference is used? I can solve the Rubik's Cube. Therefore, I can solve the Rubik's Cube or hold my breath for 12 days. First of all, is that a true statement? It is true. What would you say? Oh. So which, which rule of inference is that? Addition, very good. All right, addition. It's this one right here. Let P be the statement that I can solve the Rubik's Cube. Let Q be whatever. I'm also a llama, right? I can solve the Rubik's Cube or I'm a llama. I can solve the 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube and I can solve the 4x4 four four Rubik's Cube. Therefore, I can solve the 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube. Which rule of inference is used there? Simplification. P is the 3x3, three three, Q is the 4x4, four four, and therefore P is true. Also, therefore, Q is true. Either one of those would have worked. That's simplification. Got it? This one's a little trickier. If I walk to work, I will be tired. If I'm tired, I will fall asleep standing up. Therefore, if I walk to work, I will fall asleep standing up. Hypothetical syllogism, right? That's when we spent a few minutes talking about. By the way, I've literally fallen asleep while I'm walking. When I was in the Navy, I was up for over 60 hours one time, something like that, 50 hours, whatever. And I was in the engine room taking logs down this you know, multi-billion dollar, at least single billion dollar war vessel in the engine room. And I'm walking around with my note, my clipboard taking notes. And all of a sudden, I'm on the other side of the engine room. And you know, when you take notes in class, and you're falling asleep, you get like you're writing something and all of a sudden it drags down the paper, right? That was on my logs, all over my logs, and I was on the other side of the engine room. I don't remember getting there. I don't know how I got there. I'm like, uh, you guys, somebody needs to come and relieve me because I'm going to explode our submarine, man. So we said a hypothetical syllogism. That is correct, right? If I walk to work, I'll get tired. If I'm tired, I'll fall asleep standing up. Therefore, if I walk to work, I'll fall asleep standing up. Okay, very good. All right. Let's take a look at this is actually uh, going to be somewhat of a proof here, okay? So what we want to do is prove that the following premises lead to this conclusion that we will be home by sunset, all right? Now, looking at these, we can probably make the conclusion without doing a formal mathematical proof, but let's just walk through it because it is relatively simple. This is premise number one. That is a true statement. It is not sunny this afternoon, and it is colder than yesterday. That is a true statement. How we know it's true is irrelevant, but it is a true. That's our premise. We will go swimming only if it is sunny. That is also a true premise. If we do not go swimming, we will, then we will take a canoe trip. That is also a premise. And if we take a canoe trip, then we will be home by sunset. Those four premises, I want to prove that those things will lead to that conclusion. We will be home by sunset. Okay? This is where we turn it into a formula and start manipulating with the Morgan's Law, rules of inference, and all this, uh, um, and all this kind of stuff. Okay? Law, rules of inference, yeah. So let's start here, right? These are our premises. What would the propositions look like for each of these? What's the first pre premise look like? Well, we're looking at just the propositions. I said premise, but I meant proposition. Uh, starting with just the proposition, we're going to write the formulas in a minute. Proposition P, it's sunny this afternoon. 
What's another proposition we need? It will go with Q. It's colder than yesterday, right? What's another one? We will go swimming, right? Just that part of it. That's a premise. Or, uh, sorry, that's a proposition. We will go swimming. We'll call it R. What else? Back up one. Uh, well, mm, it is sunny. Very good. S is, oh, so you did go. We will take a canoe trip. Yeah, sorry about that. Wrong order. But we'll get to the one where it is sunny in just a minute. We will take a canoe trip, right? That's one of the premises. We will be home by sunset. And somehow I left off the sunny one in there. Oh, that's the first thing we did. Sorry. I apologize, guys. Thank you. Yeah, because it was here and here. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. That was my brain being broken. All right. So here we go. This is, this is actually a, a proof. It's a simple one, but it's a proof. So we're going to start off with the premise. We'll just start with P, because remember, our original statement was it is not sunny this afternoon. So let's start off with the first premise here. It is not sunny this afternoon, and it is colder than yesterday. What does that look like? Not P and Q. Simple. We start with the first premise. Because remember, I'm going to have to go, um, let's see if I can, yeah, I've got them written down here for us, so that's good. Okay. So we want to just take these premises and start with them and see what we can do with them. Because we want to eventually turn it into this formula that says we will be home by sunset. We want to turn these premises into T. We want to mathematically manipulate our premises until we get to T. Because T is we will be home by sunset. I want these things to be rearranged into just simply T. Do you agree that's what we're trying to do? Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the next step here. What rule could we apply to this already? What could we do? You could do simplification. Yeah. If we did simplification, what could we end up with? We could end up with not P. What else could we end up with? Q. Okay. So let's go with not P. Now, let's time out right here. First question, do you understand what I did? Just moving from line one to line two. Second question, why did I not choose Q? Okay, so good point. Not P is more relevant. Why is it more relevant? Because we're talking about the sun a lot in this thing, right? Could I have started with Q? Sure. Now, when, if I did start with Q, somewhere along the way, I might have run into a snag where the proof kind of doesn't go anywhere. So I'm going to back up and go, all right, let me try not P. Let's see if that goes anywhere. Right? That's a very common trial and error kind of a thing. Okay? All right. So let's, we've already done one rule of inference on, on um, the first premise. So essentially, we don't, this is not a thing anymore. We don't really care about that. We've reduced it down to this. Yeah. We haven't, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, that, that's just a, that's the whole thing. Maybe this, so his question was, does it matter that this doesn't care about the afternoon? Oh, I see. Should I be more specific in my wording? Yeah, that, that's a good point. That probably should say it specifically this afternoon. That's a good point. Yeah, but I, I probably was doing that for sake of space. But that's a very good observation to watch for. Yeah, but this is saying uh, if it is sunny this afternoon. And actually, no, that doesn't matter. It does not matter in this case. Um, because we're dealing with this afternoon elsewhere and we're looking at we only go swimming if it's sunny even if that's in the middle of the night if somehow it's sunny in the middle of the night we go swimming right so that's what that premise is claiming so that, that is a little silly that it would claim that but it, maybe it's tomorrow afternoon maybe every day of our lives right but it'll it'll work its way down okay so now again we've essentially gotten rid of this and we've now just reduced it down to that Let's take a look at our next premise, which is the second one we were just talking about here. So what's our next premise? You saw it on the screen there, but hopefully you didn't see it long enough. There's a mistake that is very common to be made here. I want to see if anybody makes it. So we're looking at sunny, and we're looking at swimming. So we know that P and R are going to be involved somehow. 
he says it's a conditional. He's correct. This is tricky though. Which way does the conditional go? So we have this or we have this. What what is P there for our state? Okay. Is that a true statement? Based on our premises, is that true? Does that state this? It does not state that. This says that no matter what, if it's sunny, I'm going swimming no matter what. If it's sunny, I'm swimming. The end. Right? This is saying, what's R again? We will go swimming, therefore it is sunny. Because I will not go swimming unless it's sunny. Okay? doesn't mean if it's sunny, I have to go swimming. It's sunny out right now, but I'm not going to go swimming. But if I'm swimming, the sun is out. I do not swim in the dark or whatever, right? You guys see why that is? Okay. So there we go. R therefore P. All right, now what? What rule could we apply with what we have? Remember, this is kind of out of the picture now. Does that rule look familiar? Those two pieces that are left? Yeah, those two right there, you can use modus tollens on number two and three, and it reduces down to not R. Do you see that right here? Do you understand that? Okay, so we've essentially gotten rid of all of this now. We may want to come back and look at these, like maybe later we decided we wanted to try using Q there, but for now, we, I think we're good. All right, let's look at our next premise. So we've dealt with this one and this one. Now, this premise here. If we do not go swimming, then we will take a canoe trip. That one's pretty straightforward. What is it? What are the two variables involved? So not R and therefore S. If, it is, if we do not go swimming, therefore we will take a canoe trip, right? Not R, therefore S. Okay, now remember, the only thing that's left in this equation here is these two guys, right? Okay, so with that being the case, what can we do? What can we apply to those? Anything? Your vote for modus tollens? Anybody see something else maybe? Modus ponens? Believe it or not, it is modus ponens. Because P is just simply a placeholder. It's, it doesn't have to be P. It can be W. It can be not W. Okay? All this, this real statement says, whatever this is, if it's the same thing as that, therefore we can conclude that. All right? So in this case, we have a not R, which is the same thing as that, therefore we can conclude that. That's modus ponens. Dig it? Did I skip ahead on accident? Yeah, there we go. So we are able to conclude from that S, all right? All right, so now we have, we've dealt with three premises. Let's look at the fourth one. If we take a canoe trip, then we will be home by sunset. So how do we write that premise? What are the variables used in that one? So we have S for take a canoe trip, and we have T for home by sunset. And we're saying if we take a canoe trip, therefore T, all right? So that's the premise. Notice I'm just rewriting the premise in mathematical terms. But also notice along the way, these things evaluate, this evaluates to that, these two things evaluates to that, those two things evaluate to that. So now we're left with just S and ST, S therefore T. Modus ponens again, and we can conclude T, which is what we were trying to conclude, right? We were trying to conclude T. So we used modus ponens to get our final result there. And we were able to take all these things, excuse my line there, right here, all these things, and allow them to conclude that one thing right there. And if you look at our original statement, show that the following premises will conclude with that. Okay? And that's, this is not a premise right here. That's the conclusion. See it? Now, before we look at this nasty truth table, don't panic. 
Uh, how do we feel about the, what I just did there? That is a proof. Now, that's a simple proof. They get more and more involved and more complex, and we will see more complex ones on Wednesday. But let's start with this little truth table. Why is this here? I just filled out the truth table for every possible value. Now, this truth table has um, this many variables in it, five. How many rows are there? 32, why? Two to the fifth. If you're making a truth table, it's going to be the number of rows will be two, because you're just looking at true or false, to the power of how many variables you have. So you can quickly see doing a truth table for something like this, kind of a nightmare, right? And the first thing you have to do, and look at this closely, um, notice that the first we have the P here, and it's all trues up, up here, and then all falses, right? And then when we get to Q, we split for all of the trues here. We split those trues in half and falses in half. For all the falses down here, we do the same thing. We split the trues and falses, and then we keep splitting it down, right? There's the trues and falses there. And then there's just the trues and falses there. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can see the, the exponential, the binary progression or regression, however you want to word it. Nightmare, okay? But you'd have to write it all out manually like that. We are not going to do that because we use rules of inference. This truth table is proof that the rule of inference holds, but these are the red the values that we're interested in. in. Look at all these scenarios. The red ones here are, and I'm not going to dig through it in depth, but we were saying when these values were true, those were our premises, therefore T would be true. Where is a scenario where they're all true? Just right there. You see that? That's the only place that I can see where they're all true. When they are all true, look what else happens to be true. T. So this is how you would do this proof in a truth table, which is ridiculous, right? But the the idea was with the the four premises that we claimed, it's whatever, it's not raining, it's not whatever they were, whenever they're all true, we can see highlighted in purple, then T will be true. This proof table proves that the rules of inference work. Okay? Dig it? I dig sugar smack. So show that the following premises lead to this conclusion. These are the premises, one, two, three, that those three things will lead to this final conclusion. All right, so let's start off again. The first thing you have to do is turn these premises into propositions, all right? So quickly, one proposition, you will send me an email. I will finish writing the program. I will go to sleep early. I will wake up feeling refreshed. Looking at our statements, these premises, if you send me an email, then I will finish writing the program. If you do not send me an email, I will go to sleep early. And if I go to sleep early, I will wake up feeling refreshed, okay? So these cover all those scenarios. Looking at these situations, we can now make the premises, right? And if you want to go back and look at the previous slide and see that these premises will hold true based on these statements here, those, those premises are, those functions, those, or those uh, propositions are the premises that match up with those formulas that we looked at in English a moment ago. So what I'm trying to say with my whole statement is prove that this concludes that, that comes to that conclusion. So I want to manipulate this algebraically to get this, right? So step one, we start with our premise right there, P therefore Q, that's our premise. Step two, this is one I wish I had you guys do in class um, because you would have to find the contrapositive. Maybe I should have had you do it because we still have time. Um, but the first step in this case is we had to find the contrapositive because it wasn't going to go anywhere if we didn't, right? So we found the contrapositive, which that is a logical equivalence from day one. So we find the contrapositive. Then we look at our next premise. So we just converted this into this. Now let's look at our second premise and see what we can do with it. Because ultimately, what are we doing here? I'm trying to make this look like that algebraically well why do a contrapositive because the contrapositive gives me a not q and a not q is in my final result and i'm looking for a not q somewhere right so now that i've got a not q i also need i know i need an s somewhere well let's just look at what we have go to the next premise see what i can do with it okay 
You see anything I can do with it? What? Hypothetical syllogism? Say that one more time. Okay. Um, well, the first premise we've turned into something else, right? So we're ignoring the first premise now because this is the first premise, just in another form. So what Amanda pointed out is hypothetical syllogism. We have something, therefore something else, and then that something else, therefore a third thing, which means we can cut out the middleman. We can get a not Q, therefore R, which gets us still a not Q, therefore something. We're on the right track, right? So using hypothetical syllogism of number two and three, we get that, okay? Now again, I'm trying to get to here. Well, looking at what my last premise and what I have left, what can you see? There's another hypothetical syllogism, right? Look at the next premise. It's R, therefore, S. And this thing that we've narrowed everything down to with this thing, using hypothetical syllogism, we get not Q, therefore, S. Do you agree with that? Okay. And there you go. So we have now rearranged all of this to look like that. So I have shown that I can make this come to that conclusion. That if this is the case, then this will also be the case. Now, maybe this proof was saying, hey, um, prove that, you know, Q, therefore, S is true. Not not Q, but just Q, therefore, S. Well, somewhere along the way, the proof would break, and we would not have been able to prove it. In this case, we were able to get there. Okay? How do you feel about all that? So, again, this is the final thing we came to on the previous page here. We wanted to say, prove that that the, these premises lead to this. If I do not finish the program, then I will wake up feeling refreshed. Did not finish the program, therefore I woke up feeling refreshed. I will wake up feeling refreshed, okay? Universal instantiation. This is a rule of inference using quantifiers, all right? Now, we know the term instantiation. What does that mean? Yeah, when, where do we see that? Where have we heard that word before? In programming in Java, right? In Java, you have a class, and you make an instance of that class, and it's called an object, right? This is the same idea. We, if we are saying that for all x, whatever the domain is, doesn't even matter, for all x that p of x is true, then we know that p of some arbitrary value c is also true if c is in that domain, right? Whatever the domain of x is. You understand that? That one's pretty easy to understand, right? I'm claiming that whatever, for all fruit, uh, P of X is true, which P of X is its food. Okay, therefore, P of apple is true, because that's a fruit, right? It's in that domain. So I'm just simply saying, if it's true for all of them, it's true for one of them. Duh, that's pretty, pretty common sense. The one that's tricky is this one. Look at that for a minute. I'm claiming that if it's true for some arbitrary value C, then it is true for all values in the domain. That does not seem right, does it? It is correct, but it doesn't seem like it is. The way we're going to prove that later, just for now, push the I believe button, but later on we're going to look at scenarios where we're going to mathematically calculate stuff with variables and values that we don't even know what the values are, but we're still going to come to final conclusions that will ultimately prove that it's true for some random arbitrary value and therefore, it will be true for all values in the domain. We will be able to actually prove that with a proof later. Okay? For now, just believe me that it works, right? I know it's tricky. Next one, existential instantiation. Again, if it's true for this, then it's true for some specific element C. We can't just pick an arbitrary C. It is some specific element. For this one, when that's true, it's true for any given element in the, in the domain. In this scenario here, though, we're saying it exists for some case, maybe one, maybe two, maybe whatever. Therefore, there is some element out there where it's true. I think that one makes sense. The instantiations, to me, are pretty common sense. You guys feel okay about that? Okay. 
But I think the last one you will also agree with pretty easily, which is if this is true, if P of C is true for some element C, well, then there exists some element where P of X is true, right? Well, I just told you it's C, right? Does that make sense? So this is where I'm generalizing it. So there will be scenarios, and we might be able to walk through one here in a second. There will be scenarios where we're going to use this principle to prove that because it's true for all, it's true for one, or vice versa, okay? So let's take a look at this one. Premise one. Everybody in this class has taken a course in computer science. That's a premise. Marla is a student of this class. That's a premise. The conclusion is Marla has taken a course in computer science. With our human brains, that's obvious, I think. Right? Regardless of the math, that's, that statement seems obvious. Okay? But we need to look at it in terms of how we would do it as a proof when it's not as obvious. So start off here. D of X is that X is in this discrete math class. C of X is that X has taken a course in computer science. Those are reasonable predicates, right, for what we're looking at. So now, this premise here can be rewritten like this. For all X in the domain of X, if that person is in the math class, therefore they have taken a course in computer science. Agreed? That's the first premise. Our second premise right here Marla is a student in this class, so D of Marla is true. That is a known fact, right? Because Marla is sitting right there, right? Or wherever, right? Okay? So we're saying these are our premises in mathematical terms. I want to be able to prove the, that conclusion. That is not proven yet. We want to prove that. That is my final conclusion I want to prove. So I need to manipulate all this stuff to look like this. Okay? So start off with my premise. Using universal instantiation, would you agree that that must be true? Right? If some for all students, all whatever our domain is, if they're a student in this class, therefore they have taken computer science, therefore D of Marla, therefore C of Marla. Why did I use D of Marla, not D of Bob, D of Joe, D of whatever? Because I know D of Marla is true. Because that's one of our premises. And so I, what this really is, if I was going to, if we're going to do universal instantiation without knowing it specifically was Marla, I'm really simply saying, D of some thing, some person, right? That's what I'm saying. It just so happens I know who that arbitrary person is. It's Marla. Okay. We, we good with that? Next premise, D of Marla. Again, we know that's true. Well, what do we see here? Modus ponens, which gives us C of Marla, which means I was able to mathematically manipulate those two things to look like that. Right? Any questions about that idea? We'll look at those again because that was quick, um, but I just want to toss it out there. But this is, these foundations, these pieces here, I'll get you in a second, these pieces here are the foundation building blocks of a proof. Everything we've looked at so far up to this point in the semester is for proofs. Going back here, the question was we assume that Marla was in the domain of X, same domain as X. We know that Marla is a student in this class and our domain is whatever it is, humans, creatures, whatever. We know that if they're in the class, therefore this has happened. Well, we know she's in the class, right? So yeah, we would probably want to be a little bit more clear that she is in that domain X. Yeah, very good. Okay, see you guys in a couple days.